Thank you so much. Now, I promise you this will be the single most interesting session of the entire two days. So let's get started. And um, thank you so much. The Wall Street Journal is indeed the uh, world's best read uh, newspaper. Thank you very much. Um, it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce a very good friend of mine, uh, someone who started his worky life literally as a photocopier salesman and is now the CEO of Europe's largest technology company, an incredible story. Someone whose best-selling autobiography, if you haven't uh, had a chance to read it, it really is an incredible uh, read, um, uh, Winner's Dream. It's a must-read for anyone involved in business, anyone interested in improving their lives, and anyone interested in humility. Um, it's a very uh, significant read. And someone who on their latest earnings call uh, felt uh, sufficiently empowered to declare, declare wow when um, reporting extraordinary growth uh, in their move into the cloud, which we may get a chance to talk about. So uh, let me just introduce to you and let's give Bill a big round of applause, please. Bill McDermott, SAP. So welcome, much. Bill. Thank you very much. How, how are you? I'm doing great, my friend. Thank you. Good to see you. Bill always makes me feel like a slouch. Um, he very nicely took off his tie because I forgot to wear a tie. So Bill is a hero of mine for taking off a tie. Thank, Thank you Thank you for much. letting me be more comfortable. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now, last time I saw you, you were in a huddle in New York City with Bon Jovi, Mike Tyson, and President Obama. Um, today, I'm sorry, it's just me and us here, so apologies for that. But it takes me on to my first question, which has to be about this thing that's so passionate for you, which is humility. Why is humility such an important thing for you, Bill? How do you live such a humble life? And tell us why it's such a significant issue for people in the room. Well, thank you very much, Will. You know, like many of you, I grew up in a a working class environment and I'm living proof that affluence is a state of mind. And going from three part-time jobs as a young teenager to owning my first business as a teenage entrepreneur taught me that you can get anything in this life you want if you help enough other people get what they want. And this delicatessen business kind of shaped me because the little one has to do with the big one is either structurally unable to do or unwilling to do. So I learned that it's all about being in service to other people, and in my case, being in service to the customer. Okay. Yeah. All right, that's, that's I love this audience. Um, it's also about risk-taking. So in the book, uh, you talk about how you got your very first job at Xerox. Um, where you go through a series of interviews in New York City and it comes to a, a crunch moment in the end of the interview day. Tell us what you did and why it was so risky and what happened. Well, I think, you know, the first big risk was being that teenage entrepreneur because in that era, you had a CRM system in my little delicatessen and you know what it was? It was a window and I could look out the window to see my customers. And I knew the senior citizens, they want things delivered. The blue collar workers like my dad, they were rich on Friday night and broke by Sunday morning, so we gave them credit. But the hard part was getting those high school kids to walk a block and a half past the high school to my little store. So what did we do? We gotta go down there and ask the kids why they're standing outside in line 40 at a time when there's only four people in the store. So upon asking him, one of the kids said to me, well, Bill, they think we're going to take things. I said, don't worry about that. Follow me down to my store. And we had built a video game room for young people to play Pac-Man and Asteroids. Anybody ever play video games? There we go. For the people that are too young to know, look it up on Wiki. It actually happened. And people would put a quarter at a time in the machine. And at the end of a long day, one of the young people said to me, Bill, when we want to have a good time, be treated with respect, and have good food, we come to your store. And when we want to steal stuff, we go to 7-Eleven. So my, my mind got shaped very early around empathy for the customer. So this day, I go for the dream job. You're going to love this one, Will. 
We live in a 1,000 square foot house in Amityville, Long Island at the time. I sell the delicatessen. I want to go into Manhattan and get the big job. I bought my $99 suit. I'm walking down the stairs, and in every case where we had a northeast storm, our house flooded. So we had four feet of water in the house. My brother carries me out to the front yard so I don't get the pants wet. I drive to the railroad tracks, and my dad said, Bill, you, I wish you good luck on the, on the interview today. I said, Dad, I guarantee you I'm coming home with a job. I guarantee you my employee badge will be in my pocket. My dad said, Bill, don't put all that pressure on yourself. You're a good guy. Just do the best you can. I said, I guarantee it. I take the long ride into New York City. I'm pumped up. I'm ready to go. Basically, Xerox at that time was building machines at a higher price point than the offshore competition was selling the machines for. Not a good business strategy. But I don't care. I'm fired up. I get into the hiring center. I look around. And I'm like, wow. I might have overshot it a little bit with my dad. Young women, young men from the greatest universities, Princeton, Notre Dame, Yale, Harvard. And here I am coming from Amityville, Long Island, with a dream. And here's what happened that day. I said, what am I going to do? I might have overshot it with my dad, but I got to pull this thing out. So I just start asking people, what are you here for? What's your goal? What are you trying to accomplish? You know what they would say? Oh, I'm here to play the field. I'm going to interview here. I'm going to interview there. I'm going to interview the other place. You know what I said? This is my day. You know why? Because yeah. I wanted it so much more you than knew. they did. Right. I wanted it. I get to the last interview of the day, the ninth one, with the big boss. I walk into his office. We have a fantastic conversation. At the end, he said, Bill, this was a really interesting meeting. Thank you very much. The HR department will get in touch with you in the next few weeks. You ever hear that before? And I said, Mr. Fullwood, I don't think you completely understand the situation, sir. He looks at me, kind of tilts his head. I said, I haven't broken a promise to my dad in 21 years, and I can't start now. I guaranteed him I'd have that employee badge in my pocket tonight. You know what he did then? He goes, Bill McDermott, as long as you haven't committed any crimes, you're hired. I said, well, Mr. Fullwood, I certainly haven't committed any crimes. You sure that means I'm hired? And he goes, yes, it does. So I get up. I kind of walk around like this, and I pick him up, carry him around, place him safely back in his chair. And then what did I do? I ran to the elevator down 38 floors, go to 57th and 6th, call my mom and dad up, and I said, Mom and Dad, I got good news. We got the job. And I said, break out the core bell. <laughs> and for those of you that don't know, Corbell is not Krug. It's like the cheapest champagne in the world. That's a great story. You are a people person, probably more than any CEO that I, I know. You have, you, you focus so much on, on not just the customer, but people. You, can, you, can you also share, there's a, there's a wonderful, and we get on to talk about other stuff, but it was a wonderful cat story from your first days at Xerox, yeah. you got to tell the people the cat story. So I get the job. Now, when you get the dream job, the next thing is, what are you going to do with it? So we get a lead to go sell something about seven blocks uptown and four avenues over. It's 95 in the shade. I got that $99 suit on. I'm carrying a copier on my back, an electronic typewriter in one hand, and my briefcase with all the brochures in the other hand. And we walk really fast uptown. We get to a beautiful brownstone. Guess what? Brownstones didn't always have elevators. So I walk all this stuff up, four flights of stairs. I could feel the sweat trickling down my cheek. Look in the door, and there she is. Chanel suit, looking like a million dollars. She has to be the CEO. This is my day. Then guess what happened? A giant cat jumps on my shoulder and puts those claws right through my $99 suit and into my skin. Now, I had a lot of confidence that the 21-year-old skin would heal, but I wasn't so sure about the suit when those nails came back out the other side. So what did I do? I held the cat, pet the cat, love the cat. Woman said to me, wow, you really love animals, don't you? And I said, especially cats. And Garfield has nothing on this cat. So I'm loving on the cat. We're loving each other, having a great conversation. The other guy says to me, hey, kid, isn't it time to plug in the machine and do the demo? 
I asked the woman, I said, do you need to see a demo? You plug a copy, you're in it has a green button, it says start, it makes a copy when you push it. And the typewriter, you plug it into the wall and it types faster because it's electronic. Do you really need to see a demonstration? What did she say? She said, I'll take two, honey. And that was the end of the story. It's a great story. <laughs> Um, I love that story. Um, uh, let's change gears. Sure. I want to talk about digital automation. So from your vantage point, uh, where you sit at the top of one of the most important companies in the world, one of the uh, largest tech companies, um, let's talk specifically about AI. How should governments and companies be preparing for the shift is taking place much faster than people realize, I think, into AI. Well, Will, you said earlier, you know, Bill, your focus has always been on people. And I believe that we are in a consumer-driven growth revolution. And the focus has to be on people, the absolute consumer. So with digital technologies, in my little store, I could know five or 700 people at a time. But we have a world of seven billion we have to attract. How do we know their behaviors? What do they like to do? They're social. They're in all kinds of channels. We have to protect their privacy. We have to now invite them into our direct-to-consumer, our wholesale, our retail channel. We need to make them an offer in real time so we give them what they want at the right price, at the right location, in the right form factor, just the way they want it. And then the whole supply chain has to absolutely fulfill on those very, very high expectations. So this idea of personalized service, whether it's healthcare, it's education, it's retail, these technologies only matter if they improve people's lives. And that is what we are determined to do, to help this world run better and improve people's lives. So you are an optimist when it comes to uh, how this is going to play out. People, there are obviously some people that take a different view uh, who are very worried about what it means. You've used the phrase digital prosperity. Yes. Can you just elaborate what that means in that context and, and, and uh, where you see it going? Sure. To me, the new economy offers us opportunities that we've never seen before. And there are many who are pessimistic about this. They see that computers could take over and people could get left behind. But I'll give you a simple example. My good friend Gary Kasparov tells the story. He was a relatively good ten, uh, chess player. And he tells the story that the computer could sometimes beat him. He could sometimes beat the computer. But when the computer was at his side, he never lost. So the idea of augmenting humanity, using deep machine learning, artificial intelligence, the internet of everything, blockchain, robotics, all of these technologies to improve the human condition, to lift people up so they can achieve more. I was at a seminar for the National Basketball Association, and the marketing leader basically tells the story around the Sacramento Kings offering season tickets in an auction. And this woman gets a notification from the team, and then a second and a third, so persistent, this woman, Sandra, that worked for the Sacramento Kings, that she finally said, my goodness, I don't know if I want to buy the ticket, but I do want to hire her because she's so good. She calls up the Sacramento Kings to say, my goodness, can I please get in touch with Sandra Sanchez? She's such a great employee. The company says there isn't a Sandra Sanchez working here. Why? because she was a bot. Now the point is, the real Sandra Sanchez is working on something that doesn't have to be mundane and tactical, something that requires human judgment and thought. So the human condition improves, productivity increases, more sales are made, more jobs are created. This is the optimism that we have to take. We have to lean into these technologies and not fear them. And how do we balance uh, the desire and need for ever greater profit. SAP is a for profit. Uh, yes. Your recent earnings, as I said, were, uh, in my words, outstanding. You. Uh, you went through a billion dollars quarterly earnings from the cloud right. for the first time. 
you're marching into CRM territory. How do you, so things are going well, Bill, right? right? And congratulations on that. How do you balance that with the deeper sense of moral purpose that is so critical for not just uh, uh, employees, your employer, 91,000 employees want to know what you stand for and why they come to work, but, but for much broader reasons than that? Yeah, well, it goes right back. You know, when I became uh, CEO in 2010, our strategy was very clear. We built it on a vision to help the world run better and improve people's lives. And when you build your strategy, you're not building it for where the world is today. You're building it for where the world is going to go in 5 and 10 and 15 years. That way, you're building something with a brighter end in mind. For us, we had to reinvent data with HANA, the only in-memory data platform for the modern enterprise. We had to basically take our ERP technologies to the cloud. We had to get everybody on mobile, and we had to give them the best user experience. And we had to help businesses do businesses with other businesses in a business network. The idea that trading partners could work on cloud computing between each other was a big, big thing. Now, every year, we basically make a portfolio planning decision on our technology. Does it help the environment? Does it help society? Okay, And does it improve the economy, the GDP of the world force? And those are the lenses we put our portfolio planning process through. So when we deliver products, we are taking on the world's biggest challenges because we believe that they are the biggest opportunities. And it's not just good for the world. It's also good for business. And that's why we've been able to double the number of employees, triple the market cap and revenues of the company. So you can, you can do well. And by doing well, you can do more good in the world. Very interesting. You mentioned the global economy, your vantage point as the CEO of one of the most important companies in the world gives you license, please, to tell us how optimistic the people in the room should be feeling. The numbers seem to be pointing to quite a rosy setup for the global economy right now. Uh, how should we think about that, Bill? Yeah, I think the, um, you know, the economy is strong and it continues to be strong for innovative companies. And you know, with this great responsibility comes determined execution. So I think tech has to be for good, but I also think tech has to be for all. And the reason I'm very optimistic is with the visionary leadership, for example, of President Macron here in France, I saw tech leaders from all over the world talking about technology for good. But I also think the, n the number one idea is tech for all. How do we get internet in the hands of all people, regardless of their economic condition? Seriously, how do we do it? You know, we know we can do it. How do we create jobs for uninitiated people in the new economy? How do we reskill workers? How do we make sure women have the fair shot and they also get the fair pay once they are hired? And how do we make sure we hire them not just for jobs, but also in management and upper management and boardrooms. So there's so much work to be done. How do we also reach out and get to differently abled people, such as autism at work, which is a major movement that we've had at SAP to capitalize on all the talents in the world? And this is the great challenge of our time. How do we do everything with renewable technologies? How do we keep this planet clean and safe so our kids have a better deal than we had? And I think this is the thought process that we have to all put into it. But I also think the consumers are extremely savvy. And when they see companies that are doing this and can actually back it up with transparency and data and facts, those are the companies that will be the winners. So not everyone's going to win. The companies that do right are the ones that are going to win. Well, look. Uh <clears throat> I promised you um, the single best session of the two days. Bill delivered it. Let's put our hands together for uh, Mr. Bill McDermott. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good hanging out with you. Hey, it's a love fest. We love it. Thank you, guys. It's fabulous. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. The Bill and Will Show. Thanks again. Um, in a lot of mental 